Okay, everybody, welcome. We are back for another biotechnology live stream. Um, this is actually our third um, we've done in the past few weeks. Um, you know, we hope you have enjoyed the previous ones. We're glad to have you back. If you're new, welcome. Uh, my name is Danielle Snowflack, and I'm the Senior Director of Education at Edvotech. We are so happy to be bringing you this biotechnology training um, in the comfort of your own home. Today, we're gonna to be talking about um, a very popular set of experiments um, from Edvotech that focus on blood typing and forensic science. So um, this is gonna be a lot of fun. So thank you so much for joining us um, and let's get started. For those of you, for those of you who are new to the live streams or new to Edvotech, um, just a little bit about our company. Um, we are the biotechnology education company. Um, we were founded over 30 years ago um, by Dr. Jack Trickian, who is a professor of biochemistry at Georgetown University. Um, now, if we're just talking about forensic science, the 80s were an incredibly important time because this is the period in time in which DNA technology and DNA analysis really came to be a technique that is used in forensic science through um, the work by um, Sir Alec Jeffries on, in, on DNA fingerprinting um, and DNA profiling. Um, and, you know, these were amazing innovations that were happening um, at the time. Um, so if we're just talking about DNA fingerprinting, we're talking about restriction enzymes, which are molecular scissors that cut DNA. We're talking about polymerase chain reaction, which allows us to create millions of copies of DNA from a small amount of starting material. And then we're talking about the actual analysis of these results. And so it's a super exciting time in the biotechnology lab, but a lot of this wasn't being translated into the teaching laboratory. Um, and so, um, you know, with this um, in mind, um, Edvotech was born. And so our focus is solely on education, on translating these super amazing scientific discoveries into the teaching classroom. Um, we work with educators to help them demystify science, to incorporate biotechnology into their classrooms, and to really foster the next generation of scientists through hands-on active learning activities. So today, um, we are doing forensic blood testing experiments. Um, the experiment that we're running is Edvotech My Lab Kit DD1191, um, which is our forensic blood typing kit. Now, uh, if you are doing any of our other experiments, um, the principles are the same. So if you're a Project Lead the Way teacher um, and you're doing blood, blood typing, the biology is going to be the same. If you run um, our Edvotech Kit um, 191, again, the principles are the same. Um, I'm just highlighting the mini kit in this, um, in this lesson since it's um, a single use kit, it's a, a one use kit, and um, you know, it's something that you could use at home or use in a distance learning classroom. Um, so it's a lot of fun. Um, so while I'm demonstrating the MyLab kit, the techniques and the science are the same for these kits. Um, the demonstration will be recorded um, and our slides will be available on the website. So if you'd like to be notified when they're posted, please fill in the form. Um, we can put that link in the chat box um, and we'll also put it up at the end of the presentation again. So in today's workshop, we are going to be discussing the ways that forensic scientists might analyze crime scene samples that might be blood. Um, in forensic analysis, there are two main kinds of tests. We are going to have a presumptive test uh, and a confirmatory test. So presumptive tests are those tests that strongly indicate whether a sample, um, it, whether a tested substance is present. So if we are talking about blood, um, you know, you might see a brown stain and you don't know whether it's blood or whether it's chocolate syrup. So we would do a presumptive test to identify whether or not the sample was blood. If the sample was blood, then we would move to the next test, which is a confirmatory test. So a confirmatory test will conclusively prove what the material is. And we do that with blood using blood group typing. And so we're going to be doing these two experiments today, an experiment that tests for blood, um, detects blood, and then one that actually types it. Um, now to be clear, so these are simulated blood samples, so there are no biohazards to bring into your home. Um, but I will be using my proper uh, personal protective equipment um, just for completeness sake. Um, you know, we always want to be careful in the lab. Um, you know, even though these are safe, you still probably don't want to eat them or drink them or get them in your eyes. Um, you know, I think that's pretty good. Um, pretty good rules for the lab, whether it's in your basement like mine is or in your school. Um, 
And so over the course of this workshop, we are going to be talking about forensic science, the chemistry of blood te testing, and we're going to highlight some STEM careers in forensics. So let's get started. What is forensic science? What does forensic science mean to you? Um, so simply put, I like to think of forensic science as the application of scientific knowledge and methodology to answer legal questions. Um, we most often think of forensic science as DNA fingerprinting of crime scene samples, but there are so many more aspects to forensic science that come together to, to form this field. Not only is science, um, you know, but um, the evidence collection, the documentation, et cetera. So in, in order to answer these legal questions, forensic scientists are gonna collect and analyze um, evidence from the scene of a crime. Uh, they need to keep the evidence secure um, so that it can't be tampered with um, and note the chain of custody to ensure that you know, the, the evidence has been handled safely, properly, and by the correct individuals throughout the entirety of the forensic analysis process. Furthermore, um, forensic scientists must keep great records of their experiments because these results are evidence, um, you know, and they're really important for determining whether or not, um, for providing evidence and determining whether or not a person may have committed a crime. Um, after analyzing the evidence, um, forensic scientists do also act as expert witnesses at trials by providing detailed reports and expert testimonies at trial. So forensic science is not a single discipline. So forensic science actually uses techniques from many different disciplines um, in analyzing information. Um, so because it's not a single scientific discipline, um, assays from many different disciplines are used to analyze evidence. Um, and so here's just a sampling of so biological and chemical sciences topics that are in assays that are brought into the forensic science lab. Um, and so, for example, um, forensic anthropology, uh, anthropologists, they're going to analyze remains in advanced stage, stages of decomposition. Uh, the scientists are going to look at the shape and size of bones and teeth and look for any breaks or fractures or different structural anomalies that might give them information on how the person died, who they are, and when they died. And if we're using a pop culture reference, and so I know I watch this show, um, I don't know if high school students watch this show anymore, though it is in reruns all the time, um, we could talk about the television show Bones. And so Bones uh, featured a forensic anthropologist who used her skills in the laboratory to identify victims and solve crimes. And a lot of times this evidence was broken bones or you know other kind of bizarre situations, which may not be applicable to the real world, but make for great television. Um, next, there are genetics and molecular biology, and this is where a lot of biotechnology does come into play. Um, so for these tests, the scientist is going to analyze biological material like blood, saliva, urine, and, and other body tissues. Um, technologies include the use of antibodies to detect whether a sample is blood, um, and then to test for the blood type. Um, blood typing can be used to exclude suspects if the blood is the wrong type, and we'll discuss that in our, in our lesson. Um, and from those DNA samples, we can actually create a DNA profile. From, the, from those biologic samples, we can create a DNA profile looking at different markers within the DNA um, to identify um, who may or may not have been at crime scene evidence, to identify unknown um, victims, um, and so forth and so on. So DNA is a very powerful evidence um, for the forensic scientist. Um, in the early days, they used southern blot for DNA fingerprinting. It took a long time, but it was very specific. Uh, today, we actually do use that polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, to take vanishingly small quantities of DNA and amplify it, um, and look to look at very targeted specific regions of the human genome. Um, uh, toxicology plays a huge, uh, huge role in forensic science, so we're going to identify poisons or drugs and alcohol in tissues and body fluids. Now, this could be either um, from the blood samples can be taken from a victim, it can be taken from a perpetrator um, to look for the presence of altering agents like drugs or alcohol. Um, we could use it to determine if a person was drugged before a crime occurred. Um, for other people, other people, you know, they might be affected by a poison, and we would use toxicology to detect the poison in these bodily fluids. Um, chemistry is also very commonly used in the forensic science lab, and these are kind of fun because you're um, analyzing physical evidence using um, different sort of trace physical evidence using different sorts of chemistry techniques. And so, forensic chemists might perform analyses of trace evidence like drugs, paint, soil, glass, or even fibers to determine their composition and their origin. 
and then pathology. Um, pathologists are going to examine dead bodies to determine the cause of death. Um, they're going to look at many different things in their post-mortem examination. So they're going to examine wounds, take samples to send to the biologists and the chemists, um, and perform histology on the tissues. So they're going to look at the structure of the tissues to see if that gives them any evidence as to what happened to the individual. Um, and, and all of these pieces of evidence together allow the pathologist to determine the cause of death. So if we're going back to television, if you've ever watched Dr. G, medical examiner, um, she was a forensic pathologist who would um, analyze these remains. And so if you watch that show, you've seen a pathologist in action. So the thread that connects these techniques um, are the outcomes. So each of these disciplines, each of these techniques will give us evidence that together can be used to build a case. Um, for this workshop, again, we're going to be testing on, focusing on the testing of blood. Okay. So um, forensic science lessons are great, not only in teaching scientific concepts, but also in engaging critical thinking and literacy skills. Um, using these forensic science scenarios, we can push our student learning about biotechnology beyond just blood testing. So through the addition of added witness statements and police reports, um, these series of experiments can be used um, to develop important critical thinking and reading and literacy skills. Um, and so if we could put the lesson, the link to the lesson in the lesson plan in the um, chat box right now, um, that would be great. Um, so we actually have a lesson available um, on our website that um, is going to provide witness statements. Um, it's going to provide alibis for certain suspects. Um, and then the students would perform the laboratory analysis. And so while performing these tests, students keep careful notes documenting their chain of custody, um, and the results of the tests would be performed in, would be recorded and kept in the lab notebook. Using evidence gathered from experiments and from critical reading of these witness statements, um, your students are then going to form a hypothesis and write a persuasive essay to build a case for or against a specific suspect being involved in a crime. Um, and so this, after performing the investigation and giving the results, um, your students are going to have experience with data collection, critical analysis of results, scientific inquiry, and thinking about the right tests to do and how to do them, and then also in persuasive writing. And through my conversation with educators, um, the students are really engaged through these lessons, um, and they have a lot of fun with the whole, the whole experience. So today we are going to be talking about a crime that occurred in a lab. And so this scenario is roughly based off of what is described in the lesson plan. Um, so late one night, an intrepid scientist was working on an important biotechnology experiment in the laboratory. So she was working on a vaccine that could be um, used, uh, let's say, for against coronavirus. And, and will save many lives if, it, if it's implemented, if, if it's um, actually um, put into production. And so... Uh, after a long day's work in the lab, she decided to go home to eat dinner and get a good night's rest before coming back the next day. Um, but the next morning, the lab was in shambles. So here's a picture of a lab bench um, in shambles. Now, if you ever saw my lab bench, this is what it generally looks like. But let's pretend uh, that this lab bench is in shambles. Um, we see pages ripped out of a lab notebook. Notes are missing. Someone went into the freezer and took the most important samples for the test. Um, and so uh, detectives came um, and analyzed the scene. Um, they found that a window to the lab was broken. And furthermore, secure, uh, in, upon investigating the crime scene, the investigators, the detectives, found some blood spilled on the broken window. So when coming in through the window, someone you know, uh, may have cut their arm and the blood was spilled there. And so detectives identified this window as a potential entry point and identified the fact that some of these samples that they have found might actually be blood, which could help us narrow down who was in the lab stealing, stealing these, this vaccine. So as forensic scientists, we will enter the crime scene and collect the evidence to be analyzed. Um, our results will be presented in the, as a report in the court of law. And so what kind of evidence is going to be analyzed? So the success or failure of a criminal investigation begins with the identification and proper collection of these samples from the crime scene. Uh, any sample contamination can lead to false negatives or false positives, which would compromise our investigation. So forensic scientists must make careful observations and identify any material left at the scene, which could potentially be evidence. Um, the material left behind in the crime scene can be a stain of blood, it can be fingerprints, a few cells left under a victim's fingernails, a human hair, and many more. Um, however, a red stain on the floor cannot immediately be assumed to be blood. 
Um, and a piece of hair may not have necessarily been from the perpetrator. So the first step with dealing with any biological evidence is to correctly identify the material. You're not just going to jump into a long, expensive DNA fingerprinting experiment without making sure the sample that you're starting with is blood to begin with. So even if we're talking about a blood sample, we have to make sure that it is human blood and not animal blood. And we actually have a test for that as well. And we're not going to go into it today, but it is our, our Ocarloni experiment. Um, so taking this evidence, detectives must then take this information, the forensic scientists will collect the evidence, analyze it, and then give the evidence or report of the evidence to the detectives who will take that information and piece it together along with the motive, the alibi, and the abilities to create, the, to do the crime um, in order to determine the criminal. All right, so let's go to my webcam. So what are we gonna to need to actually perform the forensic analysis of these blood samples? So luckily this sample is pretty easy to run. Um, almost everything you need is included with the experiment, even the personal protective equipment. Um, all you'll need to supply is gonna be isopropanol or ethanol. I'll be wearing gloves today, but I just wanna emphasize that this experiment is a simulation. There are no human or blood or human samples involved. So let's talk about our test samples. So for our second assay, um, you know, our forensic blood typing assay, so that is what your blood samples are gonna look like. Um, we have crime scene sample, and then let me just get one of the blood samples um, from the first assay. And so these are our samples that we're gonna be dealing with. Um, for many forensic tests, um, our samples are gonna be blood or skin or cells or saliva. Um, our control sample is a sample that will let us know how the assay should react. A positive control will give a positive result and a negative control a negative result. If our controls fail, or if our assay doesn't give the correct results, um, you know, it's important to emphasize that this represents a learning moment. So you're going to want to have your students be able to analyze and explain what went wrong as carefully as if they can explain as what went right. And so I always like to say, if your controls go wrong, if something go wrong goes, with, goes wrong with your experiment, this is as much of a learning moment as getting the experiment right. Because it's important to acknowledge that science doesn't always work the way we want it to. Um, and sometimes experiments need to be repeated in order to um, get reproducible results. And even experiments that don't work can teach us important lessons. So we also have, so these are our control samples. Um, our experimental samples are gonna look much the same, so I'm gonna leave them here for now. Um, these, so we're going to have crime scene and suspect samples. And so these are the experimental samples we are going to test. And we don't know how they're gonna turn out, whether they'll be positive or negative for blood. And that's the reason why we're testing them. Um, and so we are gonna analyze crime scene and suspect samples. We're gonna compare them to our control samples. And then this evidence will help us figure out who was at the crime scene. We're gonna be running two samples, two different tests today, the Castlemeyer test and blood group typing. So the Castlemeyer test is going to be a test that allows us to, it's the presumptive test for blood. It's gonna allow us to determine which samples contain hemoglobin, which is the protein in our blood that transports oxygens from the lungs to the body and then transfers carbon dioxide back to the lungs where it's exhaled. If a sample tests positive for hemoglobin, we would then send the sample, sample for blood typing. And so for the, flood, the, the um, Castlemeyer test, we will need alcohol. So oh, let me make sure I have the lid on this jar. So I have a little jar of it. So this is one thing that's actually not included with the, um, with the kit. So you'll need alcohol, um, either ethanol or isopropanol. Now, either of the two will work. And so the ethanol, when dripped on the sample, um, it's gonna cause the cells on the swab to break open at, or lice. And this is important because we're testing for hemoglobin, which is usually contained within red blood cells. Now, by breaking open the cells, we're making the hemoglobin accessible to our blood testing reagents. Uh, next, we will apply phenolphthalein. So phenolphthalein is, you may use this in your lab. It's an acid-base indicator. Or, um, it's colorless and acidic solutions and pink and basic solutions. Um, and this is gonna be an indicator for blood once we've added the next reagent, which is hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide reacts with the iron and hemoglobin to turn our indicator from clear to pink. And we're gonna talk about the chemistry of how that occurs later. Um, our second test, so let me move this back. Our second test is blood group typing. Okay, so we'll move that there. Um, this experiment is gonna look for proteins on the surface of blood cells, which confirms that the samples are blood and gives us some clues to the identity of the person who left behind the blood sample. 
to perform this experiment, we're going to need anti-A and anti-B serum. So these reagents are antibodies that will bind with the surface proteins on the red blood cells. They'll allow us to confirm that the samples are in fact human blood, and then to go one step further and to identify the sample's blood type, A, B, AB, or O. The test is done in a microtiter plate, which is this little plate right here. Um, this is a thin piece of plastic with multiple little wells, and we can think of each well as a mini test tube of sorts. When doing the experiment, each, end of each um, well is sort of an individual reaction, an individual experiment that's done in parallel with all of the other reactions, which allows us to make a conclusion. Finally, we're going to transfer our samples and reagents into our tubes. And so many times you can do this using an adjustable volume micropipette. So here is one. Um, this is um, a highly precise piece of laboratory equipment. Um, but for this assay, um, you know, all we really need are transfer pipettes. And so that's what I'll be using today to simplify this experiment, to just to show that we can do it without any specialized equipment. All right. So in analyze, we are going to analyze blood evidence. So uh, as I mentioned before, in forensic, let me actually move this evidence in while I'm talking. So in, uh, in forensic science, we have two types of assays. We are going to have presumptive tests and confirmatory tests. Um, again, presumptive tests are going to strongly indicate whether a sample is present, while a confirmatory test conclusively prefers what the material is. So this test, this Castle-Meyer test, um, is an indicator for potential blood samples, but the blood group typing confirms it. So blood is often found in crime scenes, in splatters, in drops and drips, and analyzing these patterns is actually a field of study in itself. Uh, most blood spatter evidence is found on the victim or where the violence may have occurred. Um, blood itself can be found on clothes, skin, or in the getaway vehicle. So before we go testing all those samples, we need to confirm that they're blood. We'll test them first using a simple chemical test that distinguishes between blood and non-blood. And then we use blood group typing to allow us to do two things. First is to confirm the sample is blood, and second is to start narrowing down the suspects based on their blood group. Okay, so now we are going to move to our first test, um, the Castle-Meyer test. Um, this test was first actually described in 1903, which is a long time ago, and this was as a test to identify the, detect the presence of blood in samples using phenolphthalein and hydrogen peroxide. So let's start testing our samples. Um, so at first, let's look at our negative control sample first. So at this point, oh, let me take the lid off of my alcohol um, so that I can just go right into it. Um, so for this test, um, we're, we first take a look at our sample. So at this point, we're gonna make observations. Oh, I need to go to the next slide. Okay, so we're, we're gonna make observations. Um, it's a reddish brown stain, it's kind of coagulated. It looks like blood. Um, we'll place this item on a pa paper towel, and then we are gonna rub it with a wet swab. So I dip it in water, um, and I'm gonna rub this in the wet sample on the sample until I start to pull up some of that blood, some of that sample. Um, and we wanna be careful. We don't wanna use the same, um, we don't wanna use the same swab for different samples because we can cross contaminate, um, and we wanna make sure to be super careful. All right, so we've got this sample here. We've got a lot of our blood on here. It's pretty red. All right, and next we are going to take a drop of ethanol and we are going to place it on our swab. All right, one, two. All right, so as I said before, the alcohol is going to lyse the cells. Um, it is going to break that hemoglobin, break that, those cells open, and it's going to allow us to um, liberate, that, um, liberate that hemoglobin. Um, next, we're going to add the phenolphthalein. So let me get that out. All right. And using a transfer pipette. You're going to drip. I'm going to try and do this over the sample so that I don't contaminate everything. Um, ideally, you'd have a little more space to do this experiment than I do. Um, and, you know, you'd be able to kind of have test tube holders, which would make things a lot easier. Um, all right. So next, I'm going to then drip the hydrogen peroxide on our sample. All right. And after a couple seconds, after dropping the hydrogen peroxide on our sample, we will or we won't see a color change. And so this is our negative control. 
and we shouldn't see any sort of color change. So I'm just gonna rest that back here. Um, now let's try the next sample. So I am going to then take a wet swab. I am going to start getting some of my blood on the sample. Um, and then, so one thing we do want to be very careful about is we don't want to cross contaminate our samples. Um, we want to make sure that we are, um, you know, keeping things separate. Um, again, this is not the most ideal situation, um, but you know, we're making it work. Um, if we cross contaminate the samples, um, we would then, um, want to talk about experimental error. Um, so I do see um, in, there's a question, suppose something is red liquid found at a crime scene. So what methods confirm that is blood? So this first test that I'm doing, this is a presumptive test. So this is going to kind of let us know whether or not it's blood. Um, but the confirmatory test, which is the blood group test, does confirm that. So the first one kind of gives us a general impression of whether it's blood. The second one is going to let us know whether it's human blood or and whether what the blood type is. All right, so our next step is to then add ethanol again. So we're gonna add ethanol to this. Um, and then we will add our phenolphthalein. I go one. And then we will add our hydrogen peroxide. So um, this one is a little tricky because this tube does not have a flat bottom on it, so I can't just rest it. Um, all right, so let's go here. And I will just start to put the sample on. Now it's gonna take a couple seconds, um, but on our positive control, we can start to see it turn um, from the rusty kind of blood color to a bright pink color. So I'm just gonna rest it there um, while, the while this color change is happening. Um, I'm going to go on to our next sample, which is our crime scene sample one, um, just in the interest of time. Um, so while we are going through um, this, I just want to, my, I also want to talk a little bit about the chemistry of what's going on. Oh, come on, advanced slide. Just so you're not just watching me. All right, so the chemistry behind what we're doing on. And so we're using phenolphthalein. Um, which we usually think of in the lab as an acid base indicator. Um, let me turn this over because you should be, you can start to see really the pink color um, right there. So there's a good pink spot right there. Um, so we t generally think of phenolphthalein as an acid base indicator. Um, it's going to, at values between zero and eight, uh, the color, it's actually colorless. Um, above a pH of eight, the phenolphthalein turns a bright pink color. So I'm just adding my ethanol. Um, however, phenolphthalein also will change color in the presence of an, um, right, in, in the presence of any sort of, of an oxidizing agent. So at the molecular level, if we're thinking about what's going on here, um, the heat iron in hemoglobin is going to react with hydrogen peroxide to create water and free oxygen molecules. This depletes the hemoglobin of electrons, which it then is going to recover from our indicator molecule. Uh, the oxidation or the release of electrons from phenolphthalein is going to turn our indicator from clear to pink. Okay, so if we're looking at the sample, our crime scene one, we can start to see pink, and that's going to look that that looks like um, it's positive. So we can start to see the pink forming. Um, I hope you can see the difference between the pink and the non-pink um, in our negative control. Um, and let's test one more sample. Um, so we'll get some water and we're gonna remove this sample. And so there are a lot of different samples. There, there are a lot of different um, tests that can be used um, as presumptive tests for blood. We have, a, we have a, an attendee mentioning some of them in the um, comments, so thank you. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of different presumptive tests that would let us know what blood is first. And just like there are a lot of presumptive tests, there are also multiple confirmatory tests for blood. So we're just talking about blood group typing, um, but there are gonna be other methods that you can use um, to get the same results. So, or to, to make the same, um, you know, initial observations. So I've got my alcohol. I'm gonna add my phenolphthalein. All right, and then I'm gonna add my hydrogen peroxide. 
and we'll let it sit. And so what we can do is we can take a look at each of these samples. Um, our positive control is pink and our crime scene one is also pink. And so um, this would um, be presumptive that the sample one would be blood. And so this would be the test that we would use to move forward. We would take sample one and we would test it for the presence of DNA, for the presence of, of blood group proteins. And so um, the castle meyer test is an ideal presumptive test because it's fast, it's highly specific for hemoglobin, and it can re reliably detect blood in dilute samples. However, chemicals that can contain iron or copper oxides um, can reliably produce false negative results. Uh, and so that is one another reason why we would also we would perform a, a confirmatory test for blood. Um, so we see our first crime scene sample is positive for blood and our second crime scene sample is negative. So at this point, we would take our first crime scene sample and we'd move to the next assay to confirm that it is in fact blood. All right, so we are going to be talking about blood group typing next. Um, while I'm gonna start talking about this while I'm kind of cleaning up my lab station and setting up for the next part of the experiment. Um, but blood group typing, um, is based on the surface proteins of our blood cells. So let's think about red blood cells and blood groups. Um, there are two different proteins on the surface of red blood cells. We call them A and B. The absence of these proteins is known as type O. So because A and B are co-dominant to one another, we can actually have four blood groups in humans. We have A, we have B, we have AB, and we have O. Um, so if you wanna add a genetics lesson, um, we can actually this is a great place to dig into the genetics of blood typing, of incomplete dominance, um, and um, you know to really talk about those aspects of human biology as well. Um, but let's talk about the test itself. Um, testing for blood groups relies on the precipitation of an antigen antibody complex called agglutination. We mix blood cells with antibodies to each surface protein. That's type A or type B. If the antibody is in excess or the blood cells are in excess, we aren't going to see a reaction. However, when the antigen and the antibody are in equivalence, um, when neither component is in excess, when we're kind of at one-to-one, -one, um, we are going to see an interaction between the antigens and the antibodies that form large complexes that precipitate out of solution. Um, the mixture in the wells will look granular instead of smooth. Only blood can produce this agglutination, which is why it's classified as a confirmatory test for blood. Um, although blood typing is easy and cost effective, it cannot definitively link a suspect to a crime scene. Blood group typing will confirm that a sample of blood is human and that it's a particular blood group. But many people are gonna have the same blood type. For example, I have blood type B, I'm actually B positive, which is both a blood type and a motto for life. Um, but blood type B is present in about 10% of the population which is way too broad to link a single person to a crime scene. However, it can help us identify which suspects may have been at a crime scene and help us eliminate those that are not present. Okay, so now we are going to move on to actually doing the test. So um, we wanna be very careful to not cross-contaminate samples. So you're gonna to wanna to label um, your plates and your pipettes all before doing this experiment. I've already done that because there's no reason for you all to watch me um, label samples. Um, but you know, preparation is the key to good lab work. Um, and so, um, again, if this experiment doesn't work out as expected, this is another place to talk to your student about experimental error. Um, you know, you would have in them interpret what is going on in their lab results. All right, so I'm going to add each sample um, to the wells using the proper pipette. So we're gonna start with A. All right, so let's do, we're gonna do two drops. Do I have the right slide up? Yep, I, so you can see my procedure. I'm gonna add two drops of our simulated blood solution to each of these wells. So that was type A. And I'm being extra careful this week because last week I almost put the wrong samples into the right tube. Um, and that's another place where experimental error can occur, especially if you are talking and doing science. Um, so again, if these mistakes happen, it's okay. Um, have your students explain in their lab reports what went wrong and how they would change it next time. Um, you know, if you have a particularly chatty lab group, I'm a particularly chatty person, you know, sometimes mistakes happen. Um, but you know, we need to be careful and precise in the, um, in the test. Um, 
So let's go AB is our next sample. Um, and again, these are our control samples. So they are going to basically give us uh, something to compare to. So, um, you know, the comparison is what allows us to identify which samples are which. So A will turn, so A, if, in, if our crime scene sample matches A, it is type A blood. If it matches B, it's type B blood and so forth and so on. Um, and so you can, you can understand how, um, you know, samples could get mis, um, mishandled at this point. And again, you know, that's a reason why um, the experiments need to also be repeated multiple times in, to, in order to ensure um, that the results are actually true um, and not just an artifact of the procedure. Um, let me get a little more sample there, a little more of our crime scene sample. Um, and then we're going to get our two suspect samples. So that's my suspect two pipette. Where's my suspect one pipette? Luckily, I have extra pipettes. That one may have fallen on the floor um, in my organized chaos here I have on my desk. Um, now, if something fell on the floor in a forensic science lab, that would not be a great thing because you could imagine there might be there could be skin cells or cells from saliva or, you know, other samples that may have fallen on the floor and that could um, represent an area for contamination. Um, so if that would happen, um, you can, uh, you would imagine that that would be something to discuss in your lab report. And then here's my suspect 2 blood sample. All right. And so now that we've got all these samples placed, we are ready to do the, um, we are ready to add our anti-serum. So these anti-serum, our anti-A and our anti-B serum, now these are the antibodies um, to the A and the B protein um, that is found on the, the surface of the blood cells. Um, and remember, when we had an equivalence of our, anti, our antibody and the antigens on the top of the cells, we are going to see an agglutination reaction, which will be a granular precipitate that will form in the wells. And it may take a little while for this to happen. We usually say to incubate it for five to 10 minutes. Um, so once I get all these samples, um, once I get all these samples loaded, we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, uh, the next test that you would do. And we're also gonna talk about some careers in STEM. And so we have a great discussion going on in the chat window. Um, and my um, colleague, uh, Dr. Kelly Barford, is answering a lot of the questions. Um, you know, but we presumptive tests are often done quickly. They're going to be done at the scene of the crime um, to help you decide which tests to be done on the samples later. Um, and then, um, you know, the confirmatory tests tend to be longer and done under uh, more controlled circumstances. All right, so while these incubate, while we're waiting for the agglutination to happen, and you should be able to see an agglutination reaction happening in some of the wells already, but let's talk about what we would do next once we um, want to analyze the blood samples. Um, so the next thing we would do is to analyze the DNA. So after a sample is confirmed to be human blood, forensic scientists would turn to DNA fingerprinting, which is gonna analyze the DNA within the blood sample. So we're not analyzing red blood cells this time. Um, if you remember, red blood cells do not have a nucleus, so we'd be looking at white blood cells and other cells found in the blood. And so in humans, DNA is packaged into 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, although most of this DNA is identical between individuals, small sequence differences or polymorphisms are going to occur at specific locations throughout the genome. And if you look at this picture that I have with the chromosomes, um, each of those blue spots is where one of these polymorphisms are going to occur. And so these are heritable differences, meaning that they are inherited from the mom and dad and they segregate in a Mendelian fashion. These polymorphisms include single base pair changes and repetitive day DNA elements. And one day we will have a DNA fingerprinting workshop and I'll explain more of that. Um, we would use the polymerase chain reaction to analyze these polymorphisms at several different locations or loci within the human genome. Um, and now the term DNA fingerprinting is an analogy in itself that describes this biotechnology technique. And so let's think about actual fingerprinting and let's all take a look at our hands. At the macro level, um, you know, 
we're looking at our hands in general, our hands are all pretty much the same at the macro level. Um, we have five fingers on each hand, which attach to our palm. The palm attaches to the wrist. I'll put my hand here. Well, that doesn't really work. Um, the palm attaches to the wrist, which attaches to the arm and so forth and so on. But when we look at the fingerprints, that's when we see a difference. So each fingerprint has a unique arrangement of loops, whirls and swirls, which can differentiate each of us from one another. Um, so in the same way, the combination of polymorphisms um, found within our genome can be used to differentiate between individuals. So let's look at position A, which is on chromosome two. Um, this is one of our polymorphisms, so one of our locations. And so DNA profiling and DNA fingerprinting are gonna be the same technique. So that was a question that was asked. Um, there are just a couple different names for it. DNA profiling, DNA, DNA fingerprinting, DNA analysis. Um, basically, they're all looking at sequence differences within the human genome. And so again, let's go back to position A on chromosome two. So I might have an A, we have four nucleotides, four bases, A, C, G, and T. I might have an A in that location and you might have a T and somebody else might have another A. And so just looking at that one position on our, in our chromosomes, in our DNA, that's not gonna give us that much information um, about who left the blood sample behind. But if we look at the 13 different loci on this picture, um, the results become incredibly specific. Since an individual's genome contains a different com combination of polymorphisms or DNA differences, we can generate a unique DNA fingerprinting for that person. So if we're looking at A's and A versus T at 13 different locations, you can imagine that's, that's 13, um, you know, with the two different, um, we're looking at 13 different locations with a myriad of possibilities. Um, and that would be um, indicative in identifying who the person is. And this combination of polymorphisms um, is gonna be generate a unique DNA fingerprinting for that person. Um, so I see which is a better way to distinguish individuals, identifying SNPs or DNA fingerprinting. So we do identify single nucleotide, nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs in DNA fingerprinting. Um, so I would say that SNPs are used, so these single nucleotide polymorphisms. And we're also gonna use RIFLIPs or restriction fragment length polymorphisms. And so these are differences in the DNA. A SNP is just a difference between that A and T. The restriction fragment length polymorphisms, which I'm not gonna get into in this lesson. It's a great question and it's great for a future live stream. Um, but these RIFLIPs can give you anywhere from three to a hundred different repeats um, of this repetitive DNA sequence at a different list, a particular location. And that means instead of just having an A or a T difference, you're having the difference between three, four, five, a hundred different um, polymorphism insertions at this place. Um, and that information is even more quantitative um, in distinguishing between individuals using um, this technology. It's a great question. So once we generate a unique DNA fingerprint, we would run it through CODIS. Um, which is the combined DNA index system. And it's a database of DNA sequences that have been analyzed at these different locations. And our database can be used to compare our crime scene DNA sequence. If we don't find a match, we can upload our sequence to the database. If the sample is found at another crime scene, we can link the two crime scenes. And they can also be used to identify or rule out suspects later in the, in the investigation. So we're gonna look more closely um, at a DNA profiling or a DNA fingerprinting experiment. So in this case, forensic scientists identified a biological sample at the scene of a crime, confirmed that it was human in origin, and then analyzed the DNA using profiling filing techniques. In this example, we have DNA from two different loci or places in the genome um, that we're analyzing, and we're just calling them A and B. It doesn't necessarily matter whether they're a SNP or a RIFLIP um, or VNTR even. It's, it's just a difference in a DNA sequence. And so on this electrophoresis gel, we can see the results from our anal analysis looking at the banding patterns from a crime scene DNA, a suspect one, and a suspect two. And so if we were looking just at, at loci A, um, we wouldn't be able to make any conclusions from this evidence. Um, you can see that each person, the two suspects in the crime scene sample, have the same banding pattern at that loci A. However, we we need to add the second data point, the second loci. And by adding this, we can actually rule out suspect number one. They don't match up. They don't have the same DNA pattern. 
And so from this experiment, it looks like suspect two may have been at the crime scene, but we'd have to look at additional loci before making the final conclusion. Because even though two um, are, um, even though we have these two samples um, that uh, look similar, there are a lot more, I, a lot more um, points of comparison to make. And so um, just, I wanna wrap, before we wrap up, I just wanna talk about a couple different STEM jobs in forensic science. Um, now I know that CSI hasn't been on the air for a while now, um, but the show and other crime scene shows and detective shows have really um, impacted the way we think about forensic science um, in, in the United States and around the world. Um, but I always like to point out, it's important to recognize that this show isn't necessarily a reality. Um, it's important to recognize that forensic evidence isn't without problems with interpretation. Uh, many cases, when brought to trial, don't have the amazing wealth of evidence described in a single case on the show, um, which has become problematic in jury cases due to something called the CSI effect. Jurors insist on more forensic evidence to uh, prove someone guilty or innocent, which is just not realistic in real cases. Forensic evidence is also weighed more heavily than circumstantial evidence, which may more closely reflect what's happening um, in a particular crime. And this can work against a, a, an innocent person. Furthermore, the way forensic science is portrayed is a little bit unrealistic. For, so for instance, let's think about the forensic biologist. Their day looks less like this, this picture of the CSI poster um, from the first season, and more like this. Um, it is a scientist working in a lab, do, in a DNA sequencing lab, analyzing evidence from biological samples. They would then analyze the results and pass the results to the detectives who would then go into the field and arrest suspects and make the arrests. Um, not the forensic scientist, which is reflected in some of these crime shows. Uh, that's not to say that this isn't an exciting and um, rewarding job, but it's not, just not what it looks like on television. And so we talked a lot about biology. Um, I think it's really fascinating that computer science plays a huge role um, when we're talking about forensic science. So computer scientists are going to work behind the scenes to prevent cyber attacks, detect counterintelligence and fraud that might be happening on the internet. Um, furthermore, computer scientists play a role in information technology, which would be the forensic research and analysis of computer-related digital evidence. As technology changes and the use of technology expands, these jobs become even more important. And one that I think is really, oh, there's my computer scientist there. Um, and so one that I think is really interesting and I learned about is the role of cryptologists or code breaker. Um, these researchers are responsible for deciphering and creating secret codes and encryptions. Um, one famous example of creating a code would be the Navajo code talkers in World War II, um, which was an unbreakable code formed around the Navajo language. Um, the use of this language in concert with a simple substitution cipher proved unbreakable and contributed to the success of frontline operations in World War II. Right. So by now, our samples should be agglutinated. Um, it might be hard to see here, so I've summarized the results in a table. Um, the anti-A looks really good for me, um, and it looks like I can see it very well on the screen. The anti-B is a little bit more subtle. Um, I can see the granulation, the agglutination here by eye. Um, and you can see it around the side of the wells. Let me get a pipette tip and just point to it here in the B sample. Um, you can see that there are little granules forming. Um, that is the agglutination, so the creation of this antibody antigen complex um, where, um, where the cell surface proteins come together with the antibodies in the serum um, to precipitate out a solution. And so um, what we can see is that our controls worked. Um, the, a, yeah. the A blood is reactive to the anti-A antibody. Uh, B blood is reactive to the anti-B antibody. AB blood reacts with both, given that it has both surface proteins present on the red blood cells, and O is gonna react with neither. Um, so by this analysis, um, what we can see is that suspect two, I think I must have switched my samples. Um, which is okay. Again, this is a point where um, we would have to discuss uh, experimental error um, and we'd have to discuss why things went wrong. And again, for me, my error comes in that I am talking to you all and I probably grabbed the wrong tube. Um, but with the experiment, suspect one should have clear, it should be clear in both sample A and for the anti-A and anti-B, which would denote that they would have type O blood 
And for suspect two, we should see what we see in suspect one well, where we see the granulation in the anti-A wells and the lack of granulation, the clear, in the anti-B wells. And so um, by this analysis, we'd eliminate uh, suspect two, um, and the blood from suspect one would be further analyzed by DNA fingerprinting to determine whether it's a match. Um, and so again, you know, you know the results. Um, you, your students um, would have to explain and defend the evidence as to why it's one way or the other, um, and then put that together in a report. And so um, we've actually come to the end of our workshop. Um, I'm glad I've answered many of your questions, and I'm actually going to open up the, after this last slide, I'm going to open up to more questions if there's anyone present who has questions. So you can start getting them into the chat window now. Um, so we've come to the end of our workshop. I'm going to do a little recap. Um, in brief, forensic science is the application of scientific methodology to answer legal questions. The tools for forensic analysis are drawn from many scientific disciplines, including biotechnology. Um, there are two different kinds of tests that are used in the forensic lab. Presumptive tests strongly indicate whether a tested substance like blood is present, while a confirmatory test proves the identity of a substance. And in this lesson, we talked about presumptive and confirmatory tests for blood um, using the Castlemeyer test um, and uh, blood group typing. So data from a crime scene, from crime scene evidence can suggest that a suspect was at a crime scene, but that data alone cannot convict a person of a crime. Many lines of evidence, including witness statements and alibis, must come together to build a case against a suspect. And these results are going to be used as evidence in the court of law. And so we will be present, we will be um, posting the presentation in the slides um, in the next few days to our website, which is www.edvotech.com. Um, if you'd like us to email you when they're available, please fill out the form. Um, and if you can get the link for that um, and place that in the chat window, um, so that people can click on it. Um, it should be in the materials that I sent earlier, um, the Word document. Um, so please fill out that form and we will contact you in a few days. And so we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, and so we actually had a question submitted before the live stream. Um, and I just want to um, bring that here. Um, so the question was, um, how much blood does there need to be in a sample to be detected by the Castle-Meyer test? Um, so this test is actually very precision, precise. It can detect blood in dilutions to around 1 in 10 to the 5, which is about 1 part per 100,000. Um, and so um, we, will, um, we will be um, putting the um, presentation online. The PowerPoint will be online. It is not online yet, um, but if you fill out this form here, let me just place it in there. If you fill out this form, I will email you when the presentation is available online, um, and then you, you'll get a copy of it there. Um, so how is the agglutination test confirmatory for type O blood? And so this is a little counterintuitive because type O blood is confirmed by the lack of agglutination. And so um, in this case, and so it's a great question because the lack of a result shouldn't confirm whether or not it's type O blood, right? Um, we're not having any reaction there, and that lack of reaction could be because it's not actually blood. It could be a false positive from before. And so we've simplified it here in that, um, in that we are only testing for blood group. But in reality, if we were testing for, we were testing blood, we would not only look at blood group, but we would probably look for RH factor, which is positive or negative. Um, and there's actually about 25 or so different proteins on the surface of red blood cells um, that would be tested for to confirm or um, to, to confirm whether or not um, something is blood. And so that's a great question. It is a caveat to this kind of experiment um, where you can't prove a negative, right? Um, um, but we have simplified it in this case. Um, do we have any other questions? Um, well, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Um, we do have a suggestion to make a separate video on DNA sequencing techniques, which we can definitely do, um, and maybe even have another live stream which covers DNA fingerprinting. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I just want to say, you know, we are so happy you were here. We hope we answered your questions. Um, and But we really want to thank you for your time. Um, if you need us for anything, please reach out to us um, at edvotech.com. Uh, info at edvotech.com. Um, 
Uh, can I briefly describe the Kasselmeyer test? So the Kasselmeyer test is going to be a presumptive test for blood um, that is going to identify blood by the presence of hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin is then going to um, oxidize the phenolphthalene, um, which is present in the sample, and turn it from clear to pink. Are there other resources I would recommend? Um, uh, in terms of what kind of resources? So, I mean, great places to go would be on the internet. Uh, so here, um, you know, in the chat box, um, we've linked to a resource on implementing forensics in the classroom. Um, we have a forensics site, uh, a forensics page um, on our website, um, which is going to be in our learning center, which talks about forensic science and some of the different tests that can be performed. Um, you can also go to some of the primary sites. Um, you could go to uh, FBI.gov. Um, they have a whole section on forensic science um, to look for some um, different um, discussions of forensic science evidence. Um, you can contact your local um, police department to see whether or not they have a forensic science department that they work with that would want to talk to your students. Um, uh, about forensic science um, and really put a face to forensic science beyond just the CSI, um, beyond just people at CSI. And what I can do is find some other resources and if you fill out the, for, the Google form, um, we can email you um, those resources. Um, and Kelly is great, um, she links to the lesson plan there. Um, that sample lesson plan includes um, a police report, witness statements, and it actually links two of our experiments together, the forensic blood typing and a DNA fingerprinting example. Um, and then when you um, synthesize between the actual hands-on experimentation um, and the critical reading of the re re um, resources, um, your students can synthesize that into a persuasive essay and you really hit home with those common core literacy standards. Um, so Edvotech is a company, we are based in Washington, D.C., um, and we are the biotechnology education company. There are a lot of different ways to get in touch with us. Um, you can call us 1-800-edvotech.com, email us info at edvotech.com, and we're also very accessible at our social media channels, um, which is going to be Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, check out our YouTube channel, please subscribe. Um, you know, we, we'll let you alert you as to when we're having an, another live stream or when we put up any other resource videos. Um, today, we just launched a new resource video talking about ways you can sterilize media and reagents in the lab without an autoclave. Um, and so we're, we're populating all of our different channels with a lot of different content to help teachers. Um, and we really want to put our teachers first. Um, we pride ourselves on our customer service. Um, and the one thing I always like to point out is that most of the people who are answering your customer service questions are the people who are developing the experiments too. So we have a lot of experience with all of these different procedures um, and we want to make sure that you have the best possible experience. Um, so with that, um, if there aren't any additional questions, um, it is uh, just about two o'clock um, and so I won't keep you any longer. Um, but again, if you want the presentation, please be sure to fill out that Google form. We will get you that information once the um, presentation is processed and it's available online. Um, and you know, hopefully at some point soon, we will be able to bring these trainings back to you in person so you can really get your hands on the experiments, try them yourself, um, and figure out how to integrate them into your curriculum. Um, so thank you so much. Um, for spending your afternoon with me um, and have a great day. Um, bye now. Oh, now I got to end the stream.